Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. What? 6.01? Are we ready to kick this off? Um, so I'm, I'm privileged to be able to moderate here this morning, and so I was, I was looking back, back in May, I moderated when Philip Hess talked about, does my understanding of the atonement matter? And so now this, this morning we have Dean Taylor on and, and he's gonna, gonna speak about the atonement as well. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Dean, um, I think. Uh, a critique to some, maybe some, some other view, some of our, some of our views of the atonement. And so, yeah, this is a place for, uh, as we said, um, in our, in our stated goals of strength to strength is to stimulate candid discussion. So I hope we can do that here this morning and yeah, uh, hopefully be iron sharpening iron. Um, I don't know Dean personally, but I have had I've listened to you a good bit in the past, Dean, I'm sure, as I'm sure other people have, and, and been really uh, blessed and challenged by your your talk and your um, what you've had to say, and of course some of your past experiences. Um, yeah, I don't think we have much much more. I don't have much more to say other than um, after his presentation, we will give a chance for questions so you can be prepared with them folks be prepared if you have a question for dean and he will have a response for that i trust and and then we will also i'll also at the end dean i'll end it i'll hand it back to you to wrap up with any um any closing comments and prayer maybe so i think let's let's have prayer here before we get started let's pray Father in heaven, we thank you for today. Thank you for this new opportunity to, to be serving you. Thank you for this, um, this way that we have to gather together virtually. And I just pray your blessing on this meeting. Father, I, I pray as we think about uh, what the life and death of Jesus means that we can grow in our appreciation for, for the sacrifice and for the for the reality of what it cost you to rescue mm -hmm. us from from bondage to Satan, Father, just pray that you would uh, be with, be with Dean, bless him, and I pray that you would be in our midst and in this talk here this morning, be glorified. I pray this in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Well, I think uh, strength to strength for for hosting this. And uh, it's kind of amazing that people would get up at 6 a.m. to talk about an atonement paper, but <laughs> I praise the Lord. Um, I also have really appreciated all the emails and things that I've received and um, and the counter ones. I've, I've, uh, I love Philip's stuff. I like Mike Atniff and they've written me some letters. And so I appreciate them, shout out to them. Um, I think we could use actually a lot more peer reviewed idea within our circles where we can discuss some of these um, theologies with that have more nuances to them. And so I've really appreciated the discussion. Um, and it's been a blessing going forward. Um, I'm hoping to not make this too scholarly, too heady, um, and get more to the so what, but it kind of come from my paper that I did for seminary. And so I, I, um, it's kind of have a little bit of that, but I'm going to try to reduce that as much as possible. Um, a little history of me. Um, I, Mo I was raised in like a, a nominal evangelicalism, kind of a pop evangelicalism, but very nominal, even at that. Um, sinner's prayer, cheap grace, um, that kind of thing was, was, you know, common in my generation and in my age. And, and then Tanya and I, my wife and I, were stationed in Germany uh, in the military, in the army. And we started reading Jesus and we started to see that the teachings of Jesus really conflict with our life and with our background. And we began to ask some really big questions. Um, this led us on a long stream of things that it ended up us, us becoming conscious objectors during the Persian Gulf War uh, in the late 1980s. In the process, we found the writings of the Anabaptists and the writings of the early church. Um, coming back to America, our, 
our, our first fellowship was, was called the Tyler Early Christian Fellowship. And that was pastored by David Brousseau and another scholar, um, Paul Paval. Um, and <laughs> like we went to church with the early church. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Uh, someone could maybe argue too much, but I mean, around our table was constant discussions of Ignatius, Eusebius, Tertullian, Irenaeus. These were the things we talked about at church. These are the things we, we and we dug into the primary sources. I was young 20s and, and, and um, it was an awesome experience. And the Brousseaus really took us, Tanya and I, under their wings. And to this day, I would say that David and Deborah are very much like a, a father and mother to Tanya and I um, in, in so many different ways. Uh, of course, with church history, I call David all the time. With life decisions, I call him. And he's still very much like a dad to me. Um, we really, with, with David's emphasis, we really put a focus on the primary sources. And that was David, uh, David Rousseau. I, I mentioned Rousseau. Just, so he really puts an a, 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 a emphasis on the primary sources. And that was something that I really attribute to him in my life that we caught. And in that, we talked about several different subjects, salvation, sacraments, grace, two kingdoms, non-resistance, and the atonement were things that we would have talked about. When we came to issues like salvation and the atonement, we studied grace and salvation. We saw that the early Christians talked about them in very different ways than modern pop evangelicalism, right? I mean, I mean one of the biggest uh, differences was in the early church, you don't see anyone in anywhere try making somebody comfortable to stay in sin, except for maybe the Gnostics or something. This is something that was just completely foreign to them. And so when we looked at their salvation, their doctrines of the atonement, we saw so much depth in there of a life of the Christian life that was coming out. Rousseau taught us that Jesus gave us a kingdom uh, with a king. And that king had a way and had a cure for humanity. And we caught on to that and it was, was powerful. And I don't think we use the kingdom, kingdom uh, Christian type of uh, vocabulary in those early days, but we started listening to early John D. Martins. We started looking at his discussions on the church and the community, his, his challenging stuff on economics. And it formed a way of thinking that really emphasized the teachings of Jesus being alive today. Um, in these studies, Rousseau would teach us from the word and from the early church, and we'd often compare the early church to the modern current church situation. For example, when we'd compare grace or faith or the atonement to pop evangelicalism, it'd be like comparing, you know, um, this license to sin with this nuclear power to be holy when you look at the differences. And so we saw that clearly there's something more in the way they described faith, grace, atonement, salvation in a way than pop evangelicalism was, was showing that. In doing that, we said some pretty strong things. And it's maybe arguable that, um, that we said maybe too many strong things, but, um, but seeing that difference was I think important for my, for my understanding. And so, but one thing to keep in mind, though, is, is even in some of those strong things that are said, and, and, I, and I, I need to say that I believe that David Rousseau and myself being his pupil in those days and to this day, is that, that we are historical theologians. And, I, and we say that actually very, we see it very differently than, let's say, a very staunch systematic theologian. And I don't have time to really get into a lot of the difference, but the difference is big. Um, a historical theologian um, the way, at least the way we define it, you, you work from the assumption that the faith was once for all delivered to the saints, to the church, and that we are wringing out the text of the early Christians to have a reflections upon the scriptures. It's, it's sort of like a hermeneutic or uh, a interpretive tool just to see what is the historic faith of the church. And that drives us. It never should replace the scripture. Who cares what Origen thinks or Irenaeus thinks? It's not in the word of God we don't, we're not concerned about it. But using it as an interpretive tool is something that historical theologians like to do. Because of that, we find ourselves oftentimes seeing two sides of the story, where the systematicians, if you would, 
kind of get into a silo of thought, a historical theologian says, eh, I can see kind of this from two different directions because I see it so clearly in the early church in this way, but they're also saying these things. And that kind of nuance is important in understanding historical theology, understanding David Rousseau and understanding the way I, I'm trying to, to look at this. <clears throat> so again, the word of God is the only thing infallible. The early church is merely a tool to that. But being not um, stuck in the silo, uh, we don't wanna start with a theology and then try to go through and find early church quotes and, and scriptures to back it up. We wanna start with the word of God and then look at what the ancient faith is, is about. And that's, I think it's an important point and it's really important in this atonement debate. Um, I believe that systematic thinkers um, read guys like David Brousseau or even John D. Martin or different historians, they read them in a wrong way. And this is one of my concerns is, as I've heard um, all the time, I hear people quoting David Brousseau and, and different things that he said and some of those, uh, uh, and they're taking it in a way that takes this historical nuance, puts it into this systematic thinking and, and end up with something that's really quite different than I think what we were ever saying in those early days. Um, the atonement issue is one of these things. Um, why, but why Brousseau's teachings was so important to us is because this Christus Victor language that we studied and talked about in the early church, I do think is incredibly important. As we looked at and compared modern evangelicalism, we saw that if you just take penal substitutionary atonement the way that moderns were talking about it, I mean, you could basically have Jesus come as a baby and be crucified as a baby, and it really wouldn't change your theology. And that's a problem. Jesus in his entirety is our salvation. Jesus himself and all that he stood for is our salvation. And so that needed to come out. And that concept of Christus victor, that his victory over Satan and his kingdom is so important. However, my pastoral concern over this issue now and over looking over this over decades now is that many of the next generation of kingdom people, neo-anabaptists, out of a good desire to serve Christ differently than pop evangelicalism, have caught on to just a few concepts of the Christus Victor atonement theories and, and understood it actually very shallowly. Um, and thereby reducing the gospel and bringing a, uh, I, we'll talk about hopefully this at the end, an anemic worship and a, and a self-righteousness. And, and I don't know, there's something that's cynical, that's, that's overly academic, that's just missing a piety of, of a, a wonder and an appreciation and, and, a, and a, uh, um, a love of what God has done with his grace and his salvation to us. And it's, it's, it's hard to, that part is really hard to, to um, it's very subjective, I, 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 I admit. But you, you may know what I'm talking about. It, it's, it's, there's something lacking with the depth of that. So, okay, enough of the, my story on this. I want to get to some of this, uh, different things on the atonement. This is my story. <clears throat> okay, first of all. Christus Victor was the first atonement that I have ever studied. Of course, I was raised in evangelicalism, which would have had penal substitutionary atonement, but I never studied any of that. David Brousseau was my first teacher. I was a young man out of the army, and I studied that. And so that was how the first thing that I studied, and I came alive with it, and I still do. I love it. I love all those themes of it. But just because this is sort of an academic thing, I'm going to share just a few definitions. I've got some slides here. Here we go. Um, and I know it's partial screen, but I'm going to, oh, okay, maybe I'll do it like this. All right. Um, some definitions. First of all, when people talk about the atonement, Dean, what are you talking about? What do you mean by the atonement? The, the doctrine of what happened on the cross, the doctrine of our salvation. First Corinthians 15 um, one says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received 
and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for your sins, according to the scriptures. All real Christians believe in some sort of uh, atonement, that, that this is Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. How it happened, why it happened, what mechanisms is where the debates have been. So let's look at what's the, the classic, let's say, Protestant view of uh, the atonement, the penal substitutionary atonement, and, and why um, many of us in the, the neo-Anabaptist or Anabaptist or kingdom world um, would have had problems with it. Here's a definition by Jarvis Williams from Southern Seminary. <clears throat> and I think he puts it well. He says, Jesus died a violent substitutionary death to be a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of Jews and Gentiles. By this death, Jesus took upon himself God's righteous judgment and wrath. It's an important point there. Against the sins of those for whom he died. By dying is their penal substitute, like an illegal, it means an illegal term, substitute. Jesus paid the penalty for their sins, and he therefore both propitiated God's wrath against their sins and expiated their sins so that the sins of the Jews and Gentiles would be forgiven, and so that they would be justified by faith, forgiven of their sins, reconciled to God, reconciled to each other, participate in the future resurrection, and saved from God's wrath. Now, many elements of this make kingdom people nervous, <laughs> and it did me for years. But I want to I show you today that every one of these elements are, are as much present in the early church as any other of the Christus Victor themes. And that these things that, although being used in a, in a wrong way by pop evangelicalism to, for a license to sin, these elements of the, 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 the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, taking God's wrath, being a legal substitute, propitiating the wrath of God, um, and the righteousness that comes from his grace is part of the ancient faith. And I want to make the argument that it is as much part of the faith as, as any of these Christus Victor themes, which I still hold dearly. All right, so a definition from Christus Victor. People say, okay, Dean, what do you mean by Christus Victor? Um, here's one by J. Denny Weaver, certainly one of the most outspoken of the Christus Victor and the Neo-Anabaptist camp, says it this way. This atonement image is used as the image of a cosmic battle between good and evil, between the forces of God and those of Satan. And that fray, God's son, Jesus Christ, was killed, an apparent defeat of God and victory by Satan, However, Jesus' resurrection turned that seeming defeat into a great victory, which for ever, for, forever, ever revealed God's control of the universe and freed sinful humans from the power of sin and Satan. This motif carries the designation of classic because it is the prevailing view found in the early church theologians. A variation of the classic or victory motif depicted Christ's death as the ransom price paid to Satan in exchange for freeing the sinners Satan held captive. With his resurrection, Christ then escaped the clutches of Satan and sinners were freed from Satan's power. Very classic. And, and I, these are amazing themes that must be understood of the early Christian view of the atonement. Can they both be true? As a historical theologian, I would say yes. If you get caught in a silo of a systematic theology, you will tend to put one over the other. And I believe that's the mistake. So um, back to my notes here. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is my note part here. So I love this. I needed this. But how did the Anabaptist community get so exclusive with it? And that was one of my questions. I, as I started reading the early church, um, you'll start to notice all through the beginning Lots of language for the first 100, 200 years, which, you know, you can certainly interpret one way or the other. Even for 300 years, you can say, okay, this can be interpreted this way, this can be interpreted that way, and you see people all the time debating it. Um, for instance, one that I put in my paper from Clement of Rome speaks to the atonement, says, says this quote, because of the love he had for us, 
Jesus Christ, our Lord, gave his blood for us by the will of God. He gave his flesh for our flesh and his soul for our soul. All right, so penal substitutionary atonement guys say, well, this is obviously talking about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to the Father for the forgiveness of our sins. Christmas Victor people say, no, 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 no. This is him paying the, the ransom to Satan and freeing us that way. And so all through the early church, you begin to, you see these things over and over in that way. And I did this. And as I began to read the early church, as I, as I studied it, I tried to interpret everything through the lens of Christus Victor. And as I did that, I, I looked for strength, I'm looking for strength in, in some of the neo-Anabaptist writers like J. Denny Weaver, like I quoted, Greg Boyd, um, Bruxy Cavi, N.T. Wright, um, really produced this strong rhetoric about the how the penal substitutionary atonement is ch cosmic sacrifice, uh, lots of strong, or was it, uh, no, cos uh, child abuse, cosmic child abuse, all kinds of really strong language against penal substitutionary atonement. And they present a rhetoric that the, all this was going on and, and that the early church never taught these things. And so as I began to, to read those things and hear that, yeah, the early church never taught these things, and I began to read those early Christian quotes, I'd get to some and say, no, that one sounds like a sacrifice to the Father. I don't know. This one sounds like imputed righteousness. I don't know. This one sounds like grace in a way that's different than we're saying. And I began to see that a lot of them didn't fit in to this pattern. And, and so I, it troubled me. And I began to start to look at it. And so I, I went back to school I, for teaching at Sattler College here. I needed to go back to seminary, getting my doctorate degree in historical theology. And I had a chance now as, a, uh, as an adult, as an older, I'm 55, to go back into the early church, to read them again, and to look at them. And there's really so much there offered. Um, like here, I've got a, like when you start to look at how easy the sources are to get to now than they, I mean, we used to drive two hours from Tyler to Dallas to look at the seminaries there, to read the early Christians. I tell my students this in class, and now you can open your phone or on any, uh, uh, and find these sources. And there's so many more things that have been translated to English and in, in before those days. And I found particularly those who are of historic bent, like David Rousseau, myself, we've been able to allow those sources and to be stretched with that. And it stretches our nuance. If you get stuck in a systematic the, uh, a silo, you have to defend this. And it begins to be, I think, rather awkward. Um, these passages just don't fit. And then when you finally let them speak for themselves, it comes alive. It really comes alive. So I begin to study and I started to say, okay, so what, where did we get this rhetoric? Why do you hear all these neo-Anabaptists um, quoting these things? Let me go back to my presentation. And they all like say the same, they present it like the same way. So I did a paper for school called Kingdom Reductionism. And I began to look at this and I found that almost all of us are following Gustav Uhland's um, historiography as he was presented in his book, Christus Victor. This was a book, uh, only about 100 pages. So I did my, my paper and, on this, and, and this is what I published. So as I, I'm going to skip for time here a little bit, look at the clock, and I got so many more quotes. I hope that I can squeeze this in. As I began to study this over the decades, I have noticed, particularly people who are bent more towards historical theology, that their language has nuance. Certainly David Brousseau's have, certainly mine has, and even N.T. Wright, who was one of the um, advocates of Christus Victor, you know, was one of the biggest attackers of penal substitutionary atonement. Just recently, I found this interview of his when I was doing my paper, and where he argued that N.T. Wright, excuse me, that, that Gustav Ulan caused this false dichotomy, that people had to either take one side or the other, and even N.T. Wright says, no, 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 that's all wrong to pit one against the other. And here at the end, I have this quote in my paper. He said, so it became the either or. So many people have thought that because we believe in penal substitutionary, penal substitution, we mustn't believe in Christus Victor. That's completely wrong. 
And seeing people like uh, N.T. Wright say that, I thought, this is impressive. So I went back to read the, the Gustav Ulan, and I found it amazing um, that truly it was a masterful work of, of and how, how much influence this has had on the Neo-Anabaptist and Kingdom world. So Gustav Ulan, I've got to do this quickly, was a, uh, a, Sweden, a Sweden, from Sweden, a Lutheran theologian, a bishop, a high bishop in the church. Um, very active there, kind of like we would uh, England would have the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was high up in uh, in Sweden. But between March and September of 1930, Gustav Ulan, a professor of systematic theology, I'll bring out from the University of Lund, delivered a series of lectures in universities in Sweden and Germany in which he presented what he called Christus Victor view of the atonement. Well, these were lectures, and so lectures. Uh, that, oops, that later then this man, A.G. Hebert, took these lectures, translated them, and put them into the book um, now called Christus Victor. Hebert himself was a liturgical scholar, like in the school of Gregory Dix, if any of y'all read any of that. And this book was incredibly influential. Now, I'm, I'm gonna skip for time, but you can see it in my paper. I'm gonna skip over these slides for time. I'm seeing the clock going too quickly. That an amazing amount of time is spent in this book in framing that this is the way any self-respecting person would read the early church. Um, so, you know, you they talk about, uh, uh, you know, that, that, well, let me give you just a few quotes here. Um, just a few here, I, I'm trying to, so like, it's, like here, Hebert explains it right from the beginning. As soon as the meaning of this view is grasped, the patristic teaching at once stand out as a strong, clear, and consistent whole, and becomes impossible to doubt that it is the view which also dominates the New Testament. It has therefore every right to be called the typical Christian view, or as Dr. Ulan phrases it, the classic idea of the atonement. They go on and on through this several times saying that any self-respecting person is gonna interpret this way. And it's just surprising. Now, you know, as I study historiography now at the doctorate level and trying to look at different things, you just kind of expect a little more humility in an academic paper. But this book, again, was, was lectures, just put it out in a very different way. Here's another quote from it. Any account of the history of the doctrine which does not give full consideration to this type of view cannot fail to be seriously misleading. Again and again, um, he, does, he does that. And one of the things he does, which this has become very tenacious in all academic circles and is the most piece of nonsense that I've ever, uh, that was, was there, is that no one had these penal substitutionary thoughts until Anselm uh, coming around the 11th century. So he presents this because, you know, people say, well, well, duh, why did we, why are we so duped into believing this penal substitutionary atonement? Why do we read Isaiah 53 and see the sacrifice of Christ as being, obviously sounds like a sacrifice to the Father? Why is that? Well, because we've all been duped by this amazing book that was written by um, Anselm of Canterbury, and after him, Thomas Aquinas, and these types of a thing, but no one had that thought before, before them uh, at, at the first thousand years of, of the church. When you become and you start to actually read any of these sources, even the sources that he's quoting, you think, wow, Ulan, this was a ridiculous statement, a ridiculous statement. And, and through person after person, he goes through uh, over and over again. He ends the book saying, I have not any intention of writing an apologia for the classic idea, which you keep labels. And if my expedition has shaped itself into something like a vindication of it, I would plead that it is because the facts themselves point that way. For it can scarcely be denied that the classic idea emerged with Christianity itself. And on that ground alone cannot be refused a claim such as neither the Latin nor the subjective type of teaching can make, Greek or Latin, to embody that which is most genuinely Christian. All right, so enough of uh, beating up on him. His, his, whatever he did, he did an excellent job of writing. It became viral uh, in the academic community, and it still is. It still is incredibly influential. C.S. Lewis loved it, many of the people. And this was during World War II. People were sick of all the violence and this idea to have a nonviolent atonement. 
and all these things. Of course, the Anabaptist then took off that and, and went uh, and loved it. So I have all that explained in the paper. You can uh, read some of that in my, in my theory of how that influenced the Anabaptist um, and how you find his historiography in all the different neo-Anabaptist writers today. Enough of that so I can have time for the primary sources themselves. So a little bit more of the, of the definitions. Um, as we look at the word penal substitutionary atonement, and I hate theological uh, Latin, uh, all these different uh, you know, terms that we put onto everything. So, but these are the terms. And so let me break down just some of those words that we need to look for in some of these early Christian quotes. The word penal just means legal. It's, uh, um, it's, a, it's a legal process. So like a penal code or something. And so the idea that there was a court or a, a guilt, a, uh, someone's found guilty, the idea that Jesus took that offense, that guilt from the wrath of God on himself and paid that price for us is what Christus Victor, Neo-Anabaptists and Kingdom people also are usually very nervous. And it's what Ulan is saying is not present for the thousand years of the church. And so substitutionary, everyone would have probably some sort of substitutionary atonement. Christus Victor, of course, has the substitute for us as being paid a ransom to Satan. Um, however, um, the substitution literally in taking our place for our sins and our punishment would be something that the Christus Victor in Ulan and Neo-Anabaptist and Kingdom people get very nervous about. So um, those are some of the passages that I'm, I'd like to show and I show in the paper. Now, here's a point that I want to make. Please, I, I, I could talk for another whole hour on how important Christus Victor is to the atonement model. I mean, the whole teachings of Jesus and his kingdom and his way and the fact that he's a cure for humanity is all that I, 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 my ministry surrounds all that so much. What's made me nervous, though, is in the zeal for that. What, what I call in my paper, many of us call it when we learn those things, we get like a kingdom epiphany, and suddenly the whole Bible comes alive in, the, in a different way, and we say, well, the teachings of Jesus are real and alive, and I just had this theological heady thing before this, but in, the, and, and in that, we lose our way, because we get like what I call in the paper, a, a, um, our kingdom epiphany leads to a blindness for us to miss some of these other things, and I believe that's what's happened. So now I'm going to look at some of these quotes from the early church, and then I'm going to turn it back over to you. Granted, I know many of us who has been uh, um, very zealous for Christus Victor are going to look at some of these quotes, particularly the earlier ones, and say, no, 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 Dean, you're, you're interpreting that all wrong. There's no way that means that you can interpret that as a Christus Victor theme. I did that too. And I did that all through the early Christians until finally, when I realized, when you get to some like in Eusebius and Origin and Chrysostom, you're saying, wait a minute, okay, there's no way that's going to fit into this um, Ulan view of Christus Victor. You begin to let all of the early church come alive in a way that's, that's actually very different. And I encourage you, allow yourself to be stretched by thinking, maybe you could interpret that in a sacrifice to Jesus Christ. I, it's my feeling that there's a piety and a, and a worship that can come out of this that is actually very important. It's not just an academic theme. All right, so let me look at some more here. I'm gonna give you the quotes, a few of them at least. Okay, the Epistle of Barnabas. Epistle of Barnabas certainly could be interpreted more than one way, um, but it's one of the earlier works, earliest as far as like 100 um, AD. Let me put it up here, moving this little thing here. And the, the, why it's the context that's important is because of the place that he uses Isaiah 53 um, and the atonement scriptures that appear to be in Isaiah 53. And the way he uses it, he seems to be using it for a sacrifice. It could be taken another way, but looking at the, the later, more clear quotes, read back with this, and I think it can be, it can be amazing. Okay, so Barnabas says this way, For to this end the Lord endured to deliver his flesh unto corruption, that by the remission of sins we might be cleansed, which cleansing is through the blood of his sprinkling, 
this cleansing of our, our, for our sins is through the blood of his sprinkling. For the scriptures concerning him contain some things relating to Israel and some things relating to us. And it speaketh thus, he was wounded for our transgressions. He hath been bruised for our sins. By his stripes we were healed. As the sheep he was led to slaughter, and as a lamb is dumb before his shears. Um, another one, another early one, is the epistle of Diognetus. Again, can easily be said in different ways to ransom uh, in Christus Victor. He actually uses the term ransom. But there's passages, there's things in here that made me think, huh, this one could certainly be taken in two different ways. And if you took it more as a sacrifice and as a righteousness that's imputed from Jesus Christ and imparted, then this could be very, uh, very different. So here's a beautiful quote. Diognetus, very early writing, said this. But when our wickedness had reached its height, the problem is sin, and it had been clearly shown that its reward, punishment, and death were impending over us. And when the time had come, which God has before appointed by manifesting his own kindness and power, how the one love of God through exceeding regard for men did not regard us with hatred, nor thrust us away, nor remember our iniquity against us, but showed great long suffering bore with us. He himself took upon him the burden of our iniquity. He gave his own son as a ransom for us, the holy one for our transgression, the blameless one for the wicked, the righteous one for the unrighteous, the incorruptible one for the corruptible, oh, the, the immortal one for those who are mortal. For what other thing was capable of covering our sins than his righteousness? Notice the covering our sin. By what other one was it possible that we, the wicked and ungodly could be justified than by the one the, by, than by the only son of god oh sweet exchange oh unsearchable operation oh benefit surpassing all expectation that the wickedness of many should be hid in a single righteous one and that the righteousness of one should justify many transgressors this whole language of us being righteous in him and, and, we, and I wish I had more time to just discuss this, even this whole concept of Christ within us. I do believe that all these people are reading it differently than the reformers do later. I made a promise to Mike Atnip that I'd bring that up. So I'll make sure I get that in. Um, hopefully I'll get that in at the end. Methodius, and, and my, my time is going quickly. You read this in my paper. Um, he makes this point about talking about the Passover and how the Passover blood that was shed on the doorpost protected us from the wrath of God, going right down to here for time's sake. Nor do they understand that by it also the death of Christ is personified by whose blood souls made safe and sealed shall be preserved from wrath and the burning of the world. And reading the whole quote, he talks about the wrath of God and how the blood of Jesus protected us from the wrath of God. And you can read that in my paper. Lactantatius did the same thing. Um, talked about this sacrifice of this of the Passover being the blood of the doorpost and these passages. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. This kind of piety is often missing in the Neo Anabaptist kingdom world, and I think there's something beautiful in it that we that we can lack if we miss this. All right, straight to origin now. Let's get into the heavyweights. All right, first of all, with origin. Um, Origen is very important because he's written in Greek, he's, he's wrote so much, and he has the one quote that's in the Antonicene period that is talked about by, um, uh, as being this ransom to, to Satan, and this is it. So there's, in all of Ulan's book, in all of the different writings about the early church, understand that the only quote that explicitly states anything like this, that the, that the atonement is the ransom paid to, to Satan, um, is this one quote. And it's really hard to find. It's actually, it's not even in the 10th set of the Antonite scenes. Only recently have I found an, an English translation. Ulan brings it out. But if you read even this quote, and here it is, but to whom did he give his soul a ransom on behalf of many? Certainly not to God. 
So would it not then be to the evil one? For he had controlled over us until the soul of Jesus was given to him as a ransom for the sakes, he who, for our, for as a ransom for our sake, he who was deceived. So you read that, but it's interesting if you read the context, which I have the, the, the source in the footnotes of my paper, you read it, you think it's actually a little more weird than you think. And it's actually much more nuanced. That as he's going on, he's making the argument that the soul was ransomed to Satan. He seems to imply, which I have here, uh, here that, the, that the flesh was, was left on the cross. The spirit was released unto the, unto the father. And the blood was, was also shed in a different way. Here I have written here. We were, okay, right here. We were ransomed for our futile manner of life, received from our ancestors, not by corruptible things, by silver and gold, but by precious blood. The apostle also says, you were brought, bought with a price, do not be slaves of men. We were bought, therefore, with the precious blood of Christ on the one hand, but on the other hand, the soul of the Son of God was given as ransom for our sake, and neither his spirit for his first entrusted to the father saying, father, receive my spirit. A little bit in a kind of an historian way, he's separating all these parts of Jesus and seeing him do all these kind of a thing. In my opinion, when I'm reading this, I'm seeing a very speculative origin. Certainly, this is not a talk on the atonement that origin is making here. And this is it, or we thought it was. When you start to see his clear language of the atonement, it really changes the picture a lot. And let's look at those clear passages. The commentary to the Romans. Origins commentary to the Romans is amazing. Um, it was, it was uh, written in Greek, uh, later translated to, to Latin. And I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm going to go a little bit later, if that's okay. I, I just see my time is going by quick. I'm, I'll get to these quotes, and then I'll hand it over. Um, but these are really important quotes. Um, in the commentary to the Romans, we see him discuss these things. Uh, Oh, it was okay, written in Greek and then translated into Latin by Rufinus. And we have that translation. We also have Eusebius who had this, this um, commentary um, and you see his response to it, which gives us some um, external criticism um, of looking at the text. And that's important. We can talk that, about that later at the, um, at the question. But let me get to some of these beautiful quotes. The biggest thing that you see in origin and the commentary to the Romans that comes out very clearly is that he explicitly states that there's more than one way to look at this miracle of salvation and the atonement and actually mentions the nuance. He says this, he says, although the holy apostles has taught us many things about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which are to be marveled at, things which are spoken about him through a, a mystery, in this passage he has brought forth something even more admirable which I do not think is easy to find in other passages of scripture. For above, he has said that Christ has given his very self as the redemption price for the entire human race. This is his Christus Victor section. So that he might redeem those who were being held in the captivity of their sins. Now he has added something even more profound and says, God predetermined him as a propitiation through faith in his blood. This means, of course, that through the sacrifice of himself, he would make God propitious to men, and through this, he would manifest his own righteousness as he forgives their past sins. With one and the same understanding, then, the apostle designate Christ as the propitiatory or propitiation, or as it frequently found in the Latin manuscripts, propitiator. There is, however, no difference whether propitiator, propitiation, or even appeasement is recorded, since in Greek, it is always expressed in one of the same word. Giving himself clarity in the interpretation, John, I mean, he then goes to 1 John 2, 2, where it says that we were um, saved by the, the, this um, propitiation. He says, but what John has said, namely that he is the appeasement or the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but the sins of the whole world. He goes on to say, after this talking about this appeasement of God's wrath, he so says, if there had not had been sin, it had not been necessary for the Son of God to become a lamb, nor had need be that he, nor had need been that he, having become incarnate, should be slaughtered. 
but he would have remained what he was, God the Word. But since sin entered into the world, whilst the necessity of sin requires a propitiation, notice that, and a propitiation is not made but by a victim. It was necessary that a victim should be provided for sin. For God is just, later on he says, and the one who was just could not justify the unjust. Did you see this language? For that reason, he wanted there to be the mediation of a propitiator so that those who were not able to be justified through their own works might be justified through him, but through faith in him. These things had to be said first as much as pertains to the explanation of his discourse in order that the apostolic reading might become clearer. He then goes on to say, and for time I'm going to skip over, he talks about that Jesus took upon imputed sin. And he talks about it, I have in my paper, in ways that are actually a little alarming to me, that, that he, has, he can't even be said, or he talks about this, this very in graphic ways, how Jesus took on our sin. And so as I, as I look at this, I'm just amazed by his very clear language that this sacrifice was made to the Father, a propitiation to the Father. It's very clear. So when someone says, do you have um, Origen's view of the atonement, and you believe in penal substitutionary atonement, say, I sure do. <laughs> because his clear language is this. Now, People will say, oh, that's Refinus, and he's interpreting it a different way, and those are interpolations for Refinus. No. If you read the whole context, it becomes remarkably alarming um, that he goes on with this and talks about grace and salvation in a way that we really need to hear. He goes on right after this and says, he himself is a propitiation through faith, and all who are faith are justified by him. In this current passage, the apostle, the apostle as if establishing the conclusion of the, pre of the previous argument now says, where then is your boasting? It's excluded. Through the law, that of works? No, but through the law of faith. For we, are, we, for we hold that a man is justified through faith without the works of the law. He is saying that the justification is faith alone suffices, so that the one who only believes is justified, even if he hasn't accomplished a single work. He said this, Origen himself saying, he is saying that the justification of faith alone suffices. And again, your faith is saved. He goes through several examples. Well, who would say he was saved by faith alone? He talks about the thief on the cross or the woman caught in adultery. And he goes on to talk about this in a way that's very powerful very sense that we have, we are without boasting. It is God's righteousness. It is his salvation. We are saved, and Origen uses the term, by faith alone. Now, I want to say, I want to say that, I, have, I, have, I want to say this, and, and Mike Atten maybe promised to say this. He does mean this very differently than pop evangelical or even as the reformers are saying this. They're talking about this faith alone as something inside of us. Sometimes people use this word theosis or something about it's, it's when that can get messed up with theological terms. It's Jesus Christ inside of us, not a theological salvation. It's really Christ within us. He goes on after he goes on and on about it's Jesus's righteousness. We have no boasting. He even uses the term, if any of us can boast in anything, how could we? Because they are nothing but filthy rags. And uses the whole Isaiah passage uh, analogy about our works being nothing but filthy rags. Origen uses all that terminology. But he does go on to say, and I promised Mike I would say this, but perhaps someone who hears these things should become lax and negligent and doing good. If in fact, faith alone suffices for him to be justified to this person, we shall say that if anyone acts unjustly after justification, notice this justification language, it is scarcely to be doubted that he has rejected the grace of justification for a person does not receive the forgiveness of sins in order that he should once again, imagine that he has been given a license to sin. For the remission is not given for future crimes, but only past ones. You can't just keep saying, oh, that's for everything in the future, too. Important, important thing. All right, Eusebius. Eusebius is amazing. He's very, he's obviously very Greek, studied all over the different places. He, we have much of our canon, much of what we know who's Orthodox Christians and all. 
um, from him. He has two works which were not in the, the 10 volume set of the Antonicene Fathers. One is the, the proof of the gospel, and it's divided into two parts, the, pro, the preparation and the demonstration. And he also has a very recent commentary that's just recently been translated into English since in 2010 on a commentary on the book of Isaiah. Imagine that. And oh, I'm running out of time. Um, I'm going to give you just some of his amazing passages um, that he says in here. Um, after, after quoting Isaiah 53, Eusebius says, and this he shows that Christ, being apart from all sin, will receive the sins of men on himself, and therefore he will suffer the penalty of sinners and will be pained on their behalf and not of his own. And if he shall be wounded by the strokes of blasphemous words, this also will be the result of our sins. For he is weakened through our sins, so that we, when he had taken on him our faults and the wounds of our wickedness, might be healed by our stripes. Another place. And the Lamb of God not only did this, but was chastened on our behalf and suffered a penalty he did not owe, but which we owed because of the multitude of our sins. And so he became the cause of the forgiveness of our sins because he received death for us and transferred to himself the scourging, the insults, and the dishonor which were due to us and drew down on himself the apportioned curse being made a curse for us. And what is that but the price of our souls? Again, in Isaiah, uh, the, the Isaiah commentary, here's a picture of it. Remarkable. Now, one thing quickly the translator said, Origen had a commentary of Isaiah, 30 volumes that Eusebius mentions. The commentator says that it looks like that it's clearly that, that Eusebius had right next to him Origen's commentary. We don't have that Isaiah commentary anymore. But when people just say, oh, Origen, you're, you're, you're quoting Refinus's interpolation. No, the external critical review of this, you have to use Eusebius, who was a big fan of Origen, and realizing what he's saying here. And he goes on to talk about, and in the commentary of Isaiah, but he was the very savior who healed our souls and cleanses every sins. Therefore, he continue on, this one bears our sins and suffers pain for us, and we accounted him. And he goes on a little, little later here, even as children, we had this view concerning him, that he suffered all these things because of us in order that he might set us free from all retribution. Therefore, he continues on, but he was wounded because our transgressions and been weakened for our iniquity. And my favorite quote comes from the other work. Um, really listen to this so that we don't get stuck in this reductionism. Eusebius, when you read through all of his works and you read through all of these early Christians, see the nuance back and forth, and they're not stuck in one way. This is what's beautiful about historic theology. You can just say, let it all speak. And listen to this quote. When we ponder, we want to get caught into just one camp. He said, the reason, he said, so how do we explain the atonement and the salvation? He says, the reason is not one, but many. First, the kingdom of the logos may be established over the living and dead. Secondly, to cleanse our sins by allowing himself to be struck and be becoming a curse for us. Third, to offer himself in sacrifice to God for the whole world. Fourthly, to destroy the reign of the devil. Fifthly, to ensure to his disciples everlasting life with God. Isn't that an amazing quote? I mean, he's talking about that the atonement, the sacrifice, the cross does all these amazing things. Brothers, let's not get re reduce the atonement to something that doesn't have all of these, these pieces to it. All right, last one, and then I'm done. All right, Chrysostom. I got to read Chrysostom. So in Chrysostom, he is considered the Greek theologian. And why, and why um, it's, Ulan talks about, you know, that this is a Latin thing and, and all this and that, that Greek can't be. Uh, so let me just read through Chrysostom and then I'll hand it over because he preaches so wonderfully. It's called the Golden Tongue. And this passage, remember that Ulan said that none of this language was existing for a thousand years. And if there was any hints of it, it was in Latin. Here we have coming from Chrysostom himself, his commentary on the passage 
that, that Jesus became a, a took upon sin for us. Who, he who knew who knows sin um, took upon that so that we become the righteousness of God. Beautiful passage, and I'll end with this, and I'll hand it back over. Commentary on this. First, he talks about he talks about the mediation there, how we are the mediators. He says, "I did not require satisfaction from them." But then he goes on to how he applied it. So here it is. He says, I say nothing of what has been said before that you have outraged him, him that has done you no wrong, him that has done you good, that he exacted not justice, that he is first to beseech through first outrage. Let none of these things be set down at present. Ought you not in justice to be reconciled for this one thing only that he has done for you? And what has he done? This. He that knew no sin, he may be sin for you. For had he achieved nothing but done only this, think how great a thing it were to give his son for those who has outraged him. Notice that language, give his son to those who outrage. But now he hath both well achieved mighty things and besides had suffered him that did no wrong to be punished for those who had done wrong. But he didn't say that but mentioned that which is far greater than this. What then is this? Him that knew no sin, he says, him that was righteousness itself, he made sin. That is suffered as a sinner to be condemned and one cursed to die. For cursed is he that hangeth on a tree. For to die thus was far greater than to die. And this he also elsewhere implies saying, becoming obedient unto death, yes, the death of the cross. For this thing carried with it not only punishment, but also disgrace. Reflect, therefore, how great a thing he bestowed on thee. For a great thing indeed it were for even a sinner to die for one whatever. For one whatever. But when he who undergoes this both is righteous and dies for the sinner, and not dies only, but even as one cursed, and not cursed only, but thereby freely bestowed upon those great goods, which we never looked for. Then with rhetorical flair, he takes it. For he says that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And I just, how Chris Austin just ponders this. What words, what thought shall be adequate to realize these things? For the righteous, saith he, he made a sinner that he might make the sinners righteous. But yea, rather, not even so. But what is greater far, for the word he employed is not the habit, but the quality itself. For he said not made him a sinner, but sin. And not him that had, and not, him that had not sinned only, but that had not even known sin, that we might become, he didn't say just righteousness. He did not say righteous, but righteousness. And the righteousness of God. God. For this is the righteousness of God. When we are justified not by works, in which case it was necessary that not a spot even should be found, but by grace, in which case all sin is done away. And this at the same time that it suffers not to be lifted up, seeing the whole is a free gift of God teaches us also the greatness of that which is given, for that which before was the righteousness of the law of works, but this is the righteousness of God. And then he gives us a little analogy of a courtroom. If one then was himself a king, beholding a robber and a malefactor under punishment, gave his well-beloved son, his only begotten and true, to be slain, watch this now, and transferred the death and the guilt as well from him to his son, who was himself of no such character, that he might both save the condemned man and clear him from evil reputation. Very clear penal uh, language there. And so this is, I just think it's amazing language there. But I, I want to give this now, and I'll hand it back over to you. This is, however, he does go on to say, reflecting on these things, he didn't say this would give us a license to sin. This did not produce in us this kind of casual um, freedom to sin. The, 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 the ancient church believed that this was a free gift of God. It was grace. We're saved by faith. But this faith was real. Reflecting these things, he says, let us fear these words more than hell. 
Let us reverence these things they express more than the kingdom. And let us not deem it grievous to be punished, but to sin. We should be feared to sin. For were he not to punish us, we ought to take vengeance on ourselves, who has been so ungrateful towards our benefactor. All right. So now I'll hand it back over, but with this one more thought, this little picture. Systematic theology, I believe, is either the, scare, the, the, the square or the circle. You, you look at this and you say, ah, it's a square. Ah, it's a circle. Postmodernism says, oh, it's both. It's both. The point of historical theology is to look at some of these silos and say, no, it's something deeper. It, it's something bigger. That Chris is victor and all this language of Christ coming into this world and rescuing us from Satan's clutches and bringing in a kingdom and a king and a way is there. But there's also the righteousness of God and his salvation, his imputed righteousness, in his, and that we have, we have no boasting in ourselves is also there. So instead of trying to pick one, let's step back and look at the ancients and say, I think there's something bigger in grace in Christ within us. There's something there, and I, and I think that this is what um, I'm hoping to bring out by looking at and, and us being just in love with these, these passages and come to it. So again, the so what of this, I believe it is my concern that pastorally and our desire to, to give evangelicals a black eye or you know what are these, these types of things is we've become cynical, we've become proud, many times in our own self-righteousness. I've seen it lead to discouragement. I've seen it to people giving up the faith. I, I've seen it to a piety. That's the hardest thing. Real quick, when I read the Moravians or Wesley, I get convicted with their letters they write to their mothers. There's something about it. Do you know what I mean? About this reverence and love of God and, and, and praise of his salvation and and praying and crying out to God for the fulfillment of this grace in our life. Somehow, I think we've lost some of that, but it goes the other way. Obviously, when you just, just into the license to sin, as Origin and Chrysostom say, you can get into the other ditch. I look at this picture and I say, let's see the depth of ancient Christianity and what our scripture gives us and allow us to worship God, but to also be in his kingdom. All right, I'll hand it over. Well, thanks a lot. <clears throat> Thank you, brother, for sharing that. Um, yeah, we're going to open it up for some questions at this at this stage. Um, just a reminder for for questions here. If if when you have if you have a question to pose, please turn your camera on to do that. If you haven't don't already have it on, uh, it's nice so we can see your face as you ask the question. Also. Um, Scripture tells us that Jesus suffered once for all. He was the final sacrifice, and let's not make Dean try to take that sacrifice on himself. <laughs> oh, oh, thanks, brother. <laughs> um, okay, so I have a question for you, Dean. So you did touch on this a little bit, and maybe that's... <clears throat> sorry, you did touch on this a little bit as you wrapped up. But I would love... Yeah, I was thinking I would love to hear some more thoughts on how... How does like the ransom Christus Victor model, how can that lead? How do you see that leading to, like you said, anemic worship? Yeah. Maybe you could I, flesh that out. I, I, have, I, have heard, I have heard report when John D. Martin's um, hymnal came out that there was a church that was really into Christus Victor. And I had a friend of mine that was visiting it. And literally, and, they, and this uh, were, were very big on uh, what they thought was Origins view and all this type of thing. We're literally ripping out of John D's hymnal, um, any kind of reference to the blood sacrifice to any kind of a, anything that would sound like Jesus was paying the price or anything like that. Um, this is an extreme, extreme case, but I have noticed within all of our circles that we almost kind of sneer at, huh, yeah, Righteousness of God, I don't know, that sounds like evangelical to me. And it's done something to us. And I, I've, I've been in this, these circles for over 20, well, 30 years since I've been with Brother David or so. <clears throat> and I, that's not the way we were in the early days. Uh, we looked at these things, but there was a, 
a nuance that we always appreciated. And it was always the mystery of grace that was part of this. Somehow it's become almost Pelagian, if you know what I mean by that. It's almost become, we're so much saying, oh, you're saved by faith and work, so I better work on my works. And then therefore, I, it, it gets, and then so in our worship, I don't know, it's like it's, when you read, I, granted they're pietists and they've got their mistakes, but there's just this crying out to God and the fulfilling of his righteousness and the salvation that comes from him and the, the, the him doing those things, as it says in Ezekiel, that he causes us to walk in his statutes and judgment and to pray for that and to ask for God to do that in me. I had a brother once say to me, Dean, if God does it in me, it doesn't count. And I said, you know what? I'm glad you said that. I'm not glad, but I completely and categorically believe it just the other way around. If God doesn't do it within me, it doesn't count. This I'm with Origen and Chrysostom and the early church. Where's the boasting then? And Paul, it's excluded because it's the righteousness of God within me, if there's anything at all. That kind of piety is tending to be lacking in our neo-Anabaptist and kingdom worlds, which is concerning me. Huh. And it's becoming cynical. Notice, haven't you noticed? We're almost being cynical. In all of these neo-Anabaptist worlds, they're sarcastic, they're cynical. It's somehow lacking something that is missing um, that seems to be inherited with this whole school. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I will, I will open it up, brothers. You have a question to pose? Go ahead and share it. I got a question. Dean. Hi. Hi, Patrick. Yeah, knuckle draggers on the line. <laughs> How do I take this and present this in the streets of Philadelphia and make it simple? Because it's starting to sound like Latin to me. Oh, no. Oh, no I, I really messed up then, Patrick. It's, it's, how, do I, how do I take this in five minutes and put it on a business card? It's, 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 it's very easy, Patrick, because this is the beauty of it. That we believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins. And that Jesus Christ will save them and, and give them and, and will make them righteous and, 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 and fill them with his grace. We can stick to those passages without explaining them away and lead them to, to, to faith in Jesus Christ and believe in that and, and watch the, what God will do. Yeah, but that took you five seconds to explain. Why did we spend an hour discussing it? When the moment <laughs> most knowledge wins, I'll back out now. I'm sorry. No, no, it's, it's great. Uh, in, in Pilgrim's Progress, the second, the second book, um, um, it, it, the Christiana, the, he takes all the, the children, uh, the, the guy takes all the children to the well. And they said, this is where your father drank from the well. Uh, and she's, and they, the children say, but it's all muddy now. And, he, and, and the guy says, yeah, the theologians muddied it up. <laughs> so um, one, of, one of David Rousseau's favorite books of mine is, is actually, will the theologians please sit down? I yes. do believe this is very clear. It's the theology in the head that we're trying to break out of that I think the reformers have made a, a bad mistake and we have made it worse for trying to correct it back and forth. But I do believe the simplicity of the gospel should be there. The point of my paper and all that was to try to correct some of the theological ditches I think we've, we've made for ourselves. I understand that and I followed you completely, but I, you know, I was talking to a um, preacher from charity and he was telling me about all these splits. And I said, brother, I never knew anything about that. I'm glad you pointed it out. Now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. I, and it's healthy. I, 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 um, I do love studying these things. It actually helps my worship. It helps my appreciation from God. We just, at the end of the day, need to come back to the simplicity. And I appreciate your, your uh, call to that, Patrick, very much. It has to be street level or it's nothing. Amen. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Dean. Thank you so much for um, your presentation here. It's, it's um, new to me to hear somebody coming back and saying, no, PSA has a place. So <laughs> but, um, I have not read books on this subject, but... Um, just a few articles over the years that got my own thinking started. And then I looked at the scriptures and I've been trying to read the scriptures through the, by keeping PSA out of it. And some places um, I read Apostle Paul and I'm like, I think he believed in PSA. Yeah. <laughs> it was, um, it was, it was uh, refreshing and encouraging to me to hear somebody like yourself this morning say, 
maybe we can believe both. Um, Christus Victor can include um, some PSA as well. So thank you for that. Um, one thing that has I have wondered already is, does the New Testament itself give us the, the verbiage of our penalty being paid? Um, the, yeah. the payment versus forgiveness thing has always been a problem for me. It's a it's a good question. I mean, so Christus Victor uh, advocates would would look at the, the the passages that talk about the ransom um, and look at that as a payment, and so that would be paid to Satan and that kind of a thing, which is an important element of 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 this. Um, the sacrifice themes, you know, are usually surround the Romans passages and the First John passages that have to do with propitiation. And so the, then, of course, then what, what usually Chris is Victor and, and Neo Anabaptist do is then try to take apart the word propitiation and say, oh, it's just the mercy seat. It's, it's just Jesus Christ himself. It's not the sacrifice in a sense of sacrifice to the Father. Why Origen and Eusebius, I think, becomes so important in those debates, because Romans is very clear on its own. I think First John, we have seen we have a, we have a, a propitiation with the Father, uh, and this cleanses us from all unrighteousness. These passages are very clear. But because we've been so scared that those sound too much like PSA, we've had to reinterpret them. Origen, Chrysostom, and Eusebius allows us to see, oh, that is, you're right, it is a simple way to read Romans, to, to, give, Pat, to give a plug for Patrick's point. It's a sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't believe it's just a theological thing, like the Reformers brought it into in the 1500s. It's a real thing, though, and it's inside of us. But yeah, those passages of a sacrifice and the payment, I think, are both in the New Testament. Good question. Well, thank, thank you, Dean. Um, I, I, so you said exactly the way I preach it. So, so I, <laughs> I, I, I say I'm, I'm say I'm not a good theologian. Like I, I you're wading through this deep stuff and I don't get it, but I, but I did get it. I mean, it, it, it ties in with, with the way it is. Um, when sometimes we get, we get so tied up with like, Oh, you believe in Calvinism? Well, I, I'm not sure I exactly know what all Calvinism or Armenia is. I just know what the Bible says. And I think that's where you're coming at here. It's like, so what does it say? And we try to put it in these camps, you know, and it's this way or it's this way. And just what does the Bible say? And so when you're all said and done here, like when you have the, the view that I am nothing and there is nothing that I can't do anything. It's just Jesus within me. And I don't care if that's PSA or if that's Vic, I don't care. All I know yeah. is that when Jesus is in me, life, and it's all because of him, we're just filled with worship. Like there's nothing else we can do. Yeah. And we're going to live lives through that way. And so just thank you for putting that in a box for me and, and kind of helping me understand what I really, what I already thought. Yeah. Amen. And, and if you notice how Paul has to defend, are we saying that we go on sinning? Um, let it never be, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, bad paraphrase there. Chris also makes the same. Uh, now keep in mind, I'm not meaning this way. Origins make the same thing. Now I'm not meaning that you can go on sinning. Most Paul. So all of these things lend us to ask the question, are you saying that I can just go on and sin? And every one of them are saying, no, God forbid. And so you're, you're right. I mean, at the end of the day, we should be able to say, I am nothing. It is by God's grace that I'm saved. It is his righteousness that I do anything. However, it should be real. The judgment will be based upon, is this real or is it not? Not my theology or my doctrinal views of the atonement that I'm going to spit out on judgment day. It needs to be a reality in my life. And so, yeah, amen. I, I think that, that that's, that's the way I look at it. Historians take these, are really uh, upset systematic theologians. And, and remember, Ulan was a systematic theologian, not a historian. And so I, I like that we can challenge these different views and say, I don't see that that fits into these things. And of course, the word of God is the only thing that, that's completely um, infallible. And it doesn't fit in all these little categories either. So yeah, thank you, brother. Thank you, brother Dean, uh, for for sharing. I really enjoyed your presentation, and I will get up at one a.m. to listen to somebody this early in the morning share so passionately. Um, <laughs> I really appreciate it, brother. 
So I'm going to ask you three questions. I'll keep them really short, and then you can okay. just just tick them off. Um, number one, have you ever have you read Keith Kreider's book Sacrifice versus Penalty? Uh, the second question is: uh, I was in a circle of of Anabaptist young people yesterday morning, mm-hmm. and the one sister was talking about a book that she was reading where she was talking about the uh, the, the crucifixion, and, and this writer was saying how God poured out his fury on Jesus on the cross. Uh, and my question for you there is, is there anything that within you wants to say, sister, there's, um, there's maybe a, 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 a other ways to, to look at that? And then lastly, my question is, um, I met with a dear Catholic Christian young man who's passionately following Christ and has, has come across us there at Sower's Harvest and has a lot of questions about who we are. And he sat down across from me on Thursday morning with 10 questions. And the last one said atonement. Mm. Um, and I, I, we never got there. We got halfway through in two hours. Um, so I'm curious what the Catholic view on the atonement is. So uh, great question. Briefly. Great, great, great question. Um, okay. First of all, the, the wrath, the wrath discussions, yeah, I, I think that um, you, you look at the the um, the way that some of the Calvin and some of the others really got on the wrath and the fury and the, and all this kind of a thing that that does there. If you read on my paper, I have it in the footnotes, and at one of those, I even give a, a, an interesting footnote from Origen where he calls the wrath in a sense of um, uh, like a father to a son, not in a murderous rage. And he actually makes the nuance of the distinction between uh, describing the kind of wrath that God puts on it. It's interesting. He does actually explicitly state this kind of thing from the father to the son, but he mentions that in that way. Um, Certainly the reformers went way too far with that. Um, And I think the understanding is that if we understand how wicked our sins are, we realize how great the, 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 um, the, the, the persecution, how, how great the punishment should be. And what does that mean? And people start to, you know, go through there and, and, and imagine all that. And some of it does make me nervous. I, I will say also, if you look at the, um, the, the Septuagint version of, of Isaiah 53, there's an interesting difference. I think you still have very clear PSA in there. You still have Jesus Christ taking our punishment, but it says that, that the father was um, freed him from the stroke. Um, and it's an interesting little nuance there that I think might bring some light into some of the way of, of, of that wrath part particular. Now, I don't want to go too far from it because some people will say, okay, I can accept it as long as you're not saying wrath. No, I think very origin, Chris, uh, Eusebius certainly, and all the early church, and then you start reading it back to the earlier ones, it's very clearly there. He is taking our punishment. Our sin is being imputed to him, his righteousness to us. Um, and, but that works out in us in a real way. Um, and so I think that that is part of the early church and it's, I would argue as much, or I would like to argue even more than a very clear explanation of Christus Victor, that the only quote that we have there is the one that I showed you from origin. All the others have to be just implied. So, um, but some of that language does make me nervous and I don't think it's necessary. If we just keep to the scriptures and keep to talking about that punishment, I don't think we need to go to all that, you know, kind of, uh, stuff. Um, Keith Kreider's book, I read through that br- quickly. It was in, uh, in a busy time in my life, and I, and I quickly read through it uh, when it came out, and I think there was a remnant article about it, um, and, I, and I read through it, and from what I understand, it was representing a, a Christus Victor uh, position, and, I've, and, I, and I, again, I love the Christus Victor position. I could sit here and talk for days and what David Rousseau, you know, taught us about this concept of the king and his kingdom and the, the power of Satan, if we don't have that in our atonement model, it's a mess. And I do believe the reformers lost that side. I, I frequently say it's not, the, it's not what the evangelicals say that often bother me. It's what they repeatedly, categorically, and systematically don't say that bothers me. And so just like you have a genetic code that you take a piece of the genetic out, uh, it it creates a very sometimes grotesque deformity. I believe that Reformation theology many times, I I love to talk about grace. I love to talk about salvation, the holiness of God, his mercy and, 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 and Jesus. I love all that. I could read the sermons all day. But if you take 
the king out and his way and the kingdom of God and, and, and those things, you end up with the grotesque theology, which I think is, was the production of what happened out of Reformation theology. So, but to this point on the atonement, um, I think that's why you need both of them. And so I love what uh, Keith is bringing that out. I do not believe that it was an Anabaptist position. Um, also, I think it's also nuanced in the Anabaptist. Michael Sattler clearly, um, I gave just a few quotes in my paper, um, um, believed in a some sort of a penal substitutionary atonement. He even talks about keeping the balance. We need to make sure we don't go by the way of the scribe or the Pharisees. It's an interesting quote. He says, the scribes or the Pharisees are how we were as Catholics, where we tried to earn our works by salvation. He said, we don't need to go by the way of the Pharisees, but the scribes write beautiful things, preach beautiful things, but there's no works that follow. We must beware of both the scribes and the Pharisees. Beautiful uh, quote from Michael Sattler. Um, great person to name a college out of, by the way. But anyway, that was a, uh, that kind of keeping that nuance, I see in the, in the early Anabaptists and the early church, and I think it's important for us to keep. So I would like to just try to bring into the conversation with Keith and with other brothers, with Philip, with Mike, with David, with all of us, that we can, we've got sources now available at our fingertips we did not have just 10 years ago. It is amazing, the sources that we have. So historical theologian guys are having a heyday now of just saying there's so many things that now, the commentary of Isaiah by Eusebius was translated in 2010. I mean, that's just remarkable. And he had Origins commentary right next to him when he wrote his own. That kind of information is coming to us now. And I think that it can, it can give us a more mature appreciation of this. And I think it can make us fall in love again with the beautiful thing that God's grace is what's doing this in our life. It is his salvation, glory to him. And I really believe that's gonna affect our worship. It's gonna affect our life in that kind of a way. Catholics, um, Catholics have some dogmatic statements that they have to keep to because of the, the dogmatic canon and that kind of thing that they do. And so therefore, they, you will usually find them defending some sort of a PSA. You can't throw, to be a self-respecting Catholic and throw Augustine too far under the bus. Um, they usually did reject his double predestination, some of those views, but um, they have a more nuanced way of seeing both the Christus Victor and the penal substitutionary atonement, and usually look at that more nuanced. The Orthodox have tended to try to give the West a black eye and say, oh, this is a West. So you hear Orthodox theologians um, um, will try to, Timothy Ware, Clissus Ware, and some of those writers will talk about it and just try to call it a Western thing. I was just writing a guy, uh, an Orthodox blog guy, and he was, he's been trying to, he's just starting now to read Chrysostom and read some of these like, wait a minute, <laughs> these guys are Greek, very Greek, Eusebius, very Greek, Chrysostom, extremely Greek. And that's not sounding like, you know, what Clissus Ware, they, they didn't say all that, I'm putting words in his mouth, but, but you're seeing many people, because I think because of the sources that are available, maturing or broadening their position. N.T. Wright himself was a lambasted the PSA. Now you're hearing him nuance a little bit more on, on talking about some of these things. So all of us who are of a historical mindset, I think are being able to say, okay, we can look at this. And I hope that we don't just say, oh, it means everything. It's a kaleidoscope view. No, 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 no. Let's step back and go, there's something deeper, there's something bigger, there's something more powerful. And I think that's the grace of God that we can just worship and uh, worship God and, and, and praise him more and see God working in us in our churches. Can you give a reference for the Michael Sattler quote? Uh, yeah, somebody help me. That's the, uh, it's in my paper. Um, what's his, his work on satisfaction of Christ? Is that it? It's in my paper, uh, uh, if you download that, um, and I have the quote on there and the source on there. Um, if somebody doesn't pop it out, I'll get it real quick here. Seller. One thing I might just yeah, on the satisfaction of Christ, 1530 track called on the satisfaction of Christ. Good title. Um, yeah, you'll appreciate that. Thank and you. Dan, Dan yeah. uh, one thing I might mention and for all of us is that, um, so Dean is talking about this paper that he wrote that is on our website. If you go to, um, to this talk, it's a uh, link there. Thank you.
Thank you, Brother Dean, for <clears throat> a very engaging presentation. Uh oh, I, I enjoyed that. <laughs> hey, thank you, Brother uh, Philip, I, and I appreciate the uh, the peer review and the back and forth. I really do. I really appreciated your stuff and uh, blessings to you, brother. Thank you. So, uh, I really think, in a lot of ways, you and I are not that far apart. Maybe we have some different perspectives in how we think about things and talk about things. Um, I think a lot of that happens when we read the early church as well, because, you know, now we have 2000 years of church history behind us. So we know how people have taken things. So yeah. while I agree with most of what is written in your paper, um, I wouldn't have said some things, some of the early Christians said, because I know how they're going to be taken mm. um, by modern ears. So I would love to spend a few hours discussing, you know, de our definitions of the atonement and what the early Christians meant and so forth. I've got lots of questions for you. Um, Let me stop real quick, Philip, on that point. I do want to give you uh, a plug for you. And, and uh, Philip, Brother Philip wrote me, Mike Adjet wrote me. And one of the things that do make me nervous, and I think this is part of Philip's point, is that um, these definitions are loaded. So when you, by the time you get out of the Reformation, you're siloed into theological terms that when you use terms like justification, sanctification, um, atonement, and all these things, you're pretty much, you get the baggage that comes with that. Um, I am trying to argue, and I think all of us history-minded people are, that they don't fit those packages. And so I don't want to be misunderstood, and I promised these brothers that I would say this, that the way those guys are meaning that is not the way I believe the early church meant it. So I'm going to break, so... I told you I'd say that in our email, so there you go, Philip, but go ahead. Keep... <laughs> thank, thank you. So uh, <clears throat> talking about the idea of sacrifice, for example, mm -hmm. um, I don't know of any Christian that there probably are some, that, w but I don't know of any that would say that Jesus' death was not a sacrifice. Uh, I made a very small sacrifice a little bit ago. I bought a candle for my wife, 10 bucks, handed it to her. Uh, it wasn't a penal sacrifice. It was just a sacrifice. Uh -huh. um, Jesus certainly uh, took the consequences of our sin upon himself. In other words, the wages of sin is death. Had there not been sin, Jesus would not have had to die. He died to release us uh, from the death that we had coming to us. So Jesus took a consequence. Um, if you wish to speak of that in terms of penalty, that's those words are not that different. Um, but the, the, uh, the definition of penal substitution by Jarvis J. Williams that you quoted, uh -huh. um, well, I have a few, I have two questions about this. I guess the first is, um, so, so Gustav Ulan did not uh -huh. um, actually mention penal substitution in his book at all. He's talking about Latin theory versus classic theory and subjective uh -huh. theory. And by Latin theory, he's talking about an atonement that is directed toward God. It's the goal is to change God. By classic theory, he thinks the goal is to change the world situation, um, whether you think that's by ransom to Satan, which is simply a subset of that, or overcoming the powers, as Ulan puts it, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so Jarvis J. Williams only talks about the Latin side of it um, in his definition, the propitiation of God. Um, he doesn't talk about anything else. If you were to write your description of the atonement, could you do that in a paragraph? What would that look oh, like? It's a great point. And, it, and it's an important point you're bringing up. Um, if that's going to be, quote, my definition of the atonement, then it'd be very wrong just to quote it like Jarvis quoted it. Um, it's, a, it's a good point you're making. And so to, it would have to incorporate both elements of that. Because I think N.T. Wright makes the, the, the point, and I think it's an excellent point, that according to this kind of a theory, this, this reduce, and, and I would say that, that the PSA by itself is very much a reductionist view. Um, you could literally have Jesus coming as a baby, being crucified as a baby, and it wouldn't change your theology at all. That's all your Christianity, that's your salvation. And N.T. Wright makes that argument. I think it's a very good argument. Um, so it, it's a good point. Uh, the, the point of the paper is to say, and you're right, uh, Ulan talks about this concept, what he's calling the classic view, what he, I think, coined as the classic view, 
Um, and he gives Irenaeus this recapitulation idea of, and really focusing on, the, on Irenaeus on the incarnation itself. Of course, Athanasius takes this uh, later with the incarnation and all those kind of passages. What he does wrong and very wrong is that he, he makes it so reduced that he excludes the PSA in his zeal and in his lectures, he would have, he, he reduced all that. What you're bringing out is, is a very good point. It works just as dangerous the other way. And so when you take the PSA arguments from Protestant evangelicalism on by themselves, they are painfully insufficient and would be just as much a reductionist view at all. So I would somehow have to incorporate both those quotes that Weaver gave and Jarvis gave, um, you know, into bringing into this package of, of, of the miracle of the atonement. And yeah, I think that that's, that's it's a very important point. Yeah. Sure. And then my next question is a series of questions, and I'll, I'm going to try to boil it down here. But if you go back to Jarvis J. Williams' quote, it has these features. Jesus took on himself God's righteous judgment and wrath against sin. Jesus paid the penalty for sin. And he propitiated or appeased God's wrath against sin. Yeah. Do you have a mental concept for how this works? In other words, um, can you picture God feeling angry at humans and directing his anger on Jesus and feeling better for, about sin after doing that? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. You know, all of these are metaphors that break down, um, even scriptural metaphors. And it's funny, like uh, even the ransom thing, Abelard in the, in the medieval times, you know, makes the, the criticism. Uh, first, he criticizes Ulan, I mean, um, Anselm, and then he criticizes the, the, the ransom view and says, so you're saying that at the heart of Christian redemption is a sacrifice to the devil? And he makes some very pointed remarks about breaking down these metaphors and trying to say, how does that change God and all these types of a thing? Um, I can't understand exactly how that is. I do think that many times in people who want to say they call it like cosmic child abuse and some of these really harsh things that some of the neo-anabaptists are saying are, are doing some damage to the Trinity and they're not seeing it so much as a sacrifice of the, of the Godhead itself and, and the, the pain and, and the involvement with the Trinity in this and tries to separate this in a way that I don't think is healthy. Um, and so all of these metaphors, I think, break down when you, when you begin to play it out. Um, the thing that I'm arguing is that clearly, in my opinion, clearly the early church spoke of it in those exact graphic languages. It's the sacrifice theme, you're right, and usually Christus Victor and the Anabaptist will, 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 will say that will change the sense of the sacrifice and make it like a, a sacrifice for a baseball game or a, or a sacrifice for somebody and that type of thing and lose the Levitical priestly bloody sacrifice that appeases you know, God for sin, that kind of a language. What I see in the early church is, is that Protestant side of the atonement that I'm seeing represented there. How that happens and how I imagine that out and where that plays gets difficult. You know, at the end of the day, can't Jesus, can't God just forgive? Um, seems to be reasonable. But when we look into the ancient faith, they seem to require that this is the kind of language that I'm seeing coming out. But I get that all the metaphors do break down after a while. Well, I would love to uh, get together with you sometime for a few hours. You need to come to State College or I need to go to Boston, I guess. And uh, I'm still trying to I, come to y'all's. Uh, I still want to try to make it down <clears throat> to that community meeting y'all are having. So hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, work through those early Christian quotes and say, does that really say what Dean Taylor's saying it does? Because when you lob an email out there, you don't know if the person just skimmed it rapidly or whether they really digested it. So <laughs> yeah, amen, brother. Amen. love to do amen. that. Amen. Um, amen. One more question. So um, just imagine a scenario where, you know, my daughter, my daughter disobeys and my son offers to take her punishment and um or maybe I ask my son to take her punishment because I don't feel like she can handle the punishment or you could, you could develop this scenario, and give as much detail as you want. But do you have a mental category where that actually satisfies some sort of either arbitrary justice or personal justice? It, the part again that I think that, that needs to be brought in is your giving of yourself 
to save her and to redeem her from some, some kind. So in, in some way that you could protect her, you can save her, you can take that on yourself. And that love that you have for your daughter is what I see within these sacrifice themes. Um, just trying to say, okay, I, I need to forgive my son. So let me go grab this kid down the street or my other son and, and beat him in her place is, is kind of breaking down the metaphors in a way that I, I, don't, I don't think is, is healthy. Um, it's the same way that Abelard did with the ransom. It's like, okay, we're sacrificing to the devil. That's going to make everything better. Um, it breaks down. Um, and so, but the point is, is that there's something going on that the righteousness of God that he gives us and he's revealed to us through the Old Testament, through the Old Testament sacrifice and through the scriptures that he gave his only begotten son as a sacrifice for our sins. And that somehow in that mystery of that, of that, that sacrifice of his sins for us and God himself giving that, that he took our place and died for our sins. And in there that we have salvation and, and by that our, our, our sins are, are paid for. And there's just a beautiful thing in there that, 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 that what Origen, Eusebius and, and Chrysostom are trying to say is that this should produce in us a wow, God saved me. He redeemed me. He, he did these things for me. And, and it takes systematicians, like you may be leaning toward the systematician side, we need you. And so you come by, yeah, but does that fit this? And does that fit that? And does that fit this? I'm coming more from a historical theological perspective and saying the systematicians may be right. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, if we're going to define an, an atonement view, you may be right, but you will be right apart from the early church. The early church had this view and, um, and the systematicians may be correct, but I, this is not what I read in the early church. Okay, well, <clears throat> I'll just make one last comment and then I'll uh, let other people speak. Uh, so I have the origins commentary on Romans one to five here. And um, I'd love to talk to you sometime about whether origin says what you're saying that he says, but in the, in the uh, forward to the commentary, um, I guess it's, it's Thomas P. Sheck, who's writing this, yeah. mm -hmm. talking about um, Origen's comments that you, you referenced on salvation by mm -hmm. uh, faith alone. And he says, talking about a commentator who's named Hyther, he says, while there is support for this view in Origen's commentary, namely the view that origin supporting salvation by faith alone the failure to address passages like that of 2 verse 4 in which origin plainly denies that faith alone suffices for justification results in a somewhat reductive depiction of origin's complete thought for when origin later speaks of justification by faith alone it is clear that he has added a qualification to the pauline text which should be interpreted in light of his previous affirmation that justification is by both faith and works. And uh, just in going over, uh, Sheck adds his own interpretation of origin. He says, these texts seem to suggest that origin can accept and even defend the expression justification by faith alone. If by this one means that the initial gift of forgiveness of sins is received by faith alone and not on account of the works of the law. But then he goes on to say that Origin believes a person stays in salvation dependent on his works. So initial salvation, you have been saved by faith alone, Origin says, but future salvation and continuing salvation depends on works in Origin's view. Now, I'm, I'm not defending that. I'm just using that as an example that there's always a context to these things that, as you well pointed out in your paper, is bigger than one paragraph and has to be considered in the context of the quotes. No, it's an excellent point, and that's why I even threw, because, because of my promise to you and Mike, I threw in um, how each of them, Christostom and Origen, went on to say those very things, and that's why I added those, the, those whole slides on that, and, it's, and it is really important, um, and so, I, and, and so the, the point is that he believes that what I, what I read in the early church, and what I read by a lot of people through church history who have hold of this kind of a view that the credit that we give for our salvation 
the power of that if any righteous act that I have. Um, I continually say, where's the boasting then? It, it, he goes on to say, uh, Origen goes on to say, is it because of Paul? Paul goes on to say, is it because of my wisdom, because of this, because of that? He even uses wisdom in the, one of the examples there in, in, the, in the commentary there. And he goes on to say, no, is it excluded? Is this completely the righteousness of Christ? However, all of these guys, and it's a very important point you're making, an important point that the commentator there is also making, it's got to be real. This is not a theology in the head. And so salvation by theology um, that you see kind of eking out of some of the Lutheran quotes and some of the Reformation and certainly become pop evangelicalism is not what these guys are saying. If it's not real, it doesn't mean anything. And so there must be a genuine change in your life. And this is where James makes sense of, of Romans is that show me your works by your faith. But we don't say that we're going to do works for our righteousness, but if they don't flow, we're not saved. And so this kind of thing I see consistent with Origen, consistent with Eusebius, consistent with the early church, and it's a very important point you're making, and I would agree with the, uh, the writer there. He doesn't mean it like the reformers mean it, and I think that's a fair statement. It needs to be said. Yeah. Some of the reformers, or some of the things that the reformers said. And sometimes you read them, I think even them we throw under the bus a little the wrong way when you start reading some of even their nuances, but nevertheless, the way it's understood we mean them certainly is this sloppy uh, pop evangelical thing, uh, once saved, always saved kind of stuff is not what Origen and Chrysostom are saying, absolutely. Thank you. Good questions, Philip. <laughs> Hope to make it down there. All right, I'll ask you the other dozen when you come here. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> we'll bring our origins and we'll geek out. It'll be great. <laughs> Brother Dean, you were, you were using the word metaphor a few times there. So would you say PSA is a metaphor? And sure. it's just an effort to try to capture or to help us give a, get a picture of a piece of our salvation. And exactly. Yeah. The other, the other metaphors give us a different piece. Yeah, exactly. And so you see the early church, I always say it's kind of like, you know, they didn't have all the baggage of all of our, you know, like that, that all of our, the baggage of all these theological frames. So they could like when you read the Eusebius works of the proof of the gospel, you literally see him throwing clear Christus Victor themes, clear sacrifice themes as a child. And I would say it's like a child in a play, uh, you know, in a playhouse or a sandbox or something they're able just to use these metaphors. So in other words, it didn't bother Eusebius to say, Jesus ra ransomed us from the power of, of Satan and his works, but then another place say he was a sacrifice to the father, but that didn't bother Eusebius. And, and, and I don't think it should bother us either because the scriptures are, are that way too. The word of God gives us these, these different things. And, and this is why I love some of those quotes that literally spell out the complexity of the metaphor. Those quotes that I gave about Eusebius saying, it's, what does he say, five different things. It does all this. And Origen saying, Jesus is this, 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 and that. And, and that all the fullness dwells in him. It's so hard for us to just put it down to a few metaphors. All of it, though, our salvation, all of our theology, everything we can exist, exists in the very person of Jesus Christ. And in that, all the fullness of the Godhead uh, is, is there bodily. And so that then we start to explain and expound and walk in our life and walk in our grace. And uh, it's beautiful. But yeah, these metaphors taken all the way to their extreme by teachers uh, tends, to, tends to get, yeah, breaks down. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a very um, important point. Um, I think the problem happens when we say, uh, this is what happened in heaven. This is what happened in yeah, heaven. Well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that's the human reasoning that we get. We try to apply to it. And, and again, I'm not against us trying to make it make sense, but we do need to receive the word of God, uh, first of all, primarily. I know we all agree with that. And we need to just say it without anybody's, you know, uh, uh, silos that we get stuck in. Then my argument, and us histor hist histor historical theologian guys, are we like to say, well, what is the ancient faith and how they looked at these things? And so we're trying to do that too. But yeah, by overly making it theological, it can be a, or 
over try, scrutinizing it to, to making it all these different things and turning it into our little packages gets dangerous. Yeah. That's good. Good questions. Appreciate appreciate what you shared this morning, Dean. Uh, I don't know quite where I fall on this. As the more we talk, the more I realize I have some pieces of both things. But Amen. I was wondering, good. I was wondering, could you talk a little bit about this concept of ransom uh, on the surface, it makes me really nervous. Like, are, are we saying God owes Satan something? Like, how can that be possible? But as, as we're discussing here, and I'm thinking about this, um, I'm realizing, I think, and I'd like you to, to speak to this, that really it's, it's me that owes Satan something or me that owes God something. And we see Christ, um, I, it almost helps me to think about it as bail. Uh, rather than ransom, because it, when you think about somebody, I, I don't know, I'd like to hear your yeah, thoughts. Yeah. Bell is right. I mean, the, the idea with ransom atonement, which comes out clearly in the early church as well, is that during the sin, excuse me, pardon me, that when man sinned, that we lost a right of um, the world to humanity, and, and Satan won some sort of right over mankind. Uh, his dominion, his power, his demons, his world. And that when Jesus Christ came, he gave himself a ransom to say, okay, I'll give myself to pay this penalty and, and, and you will let my people, uh, then you'll let my people go. So the thought is, and Gregor of Nyssa was the first one really to develop this. Um, so the thought is then, then, then Satan thought, aha, I got you. And he, and he sacrifices Jesus but then the resurrection. And then when he resurrected, he, he defeated not only sin, but death itself. And then because of that, we have the resurrection in us. And then the important part of Christus Victor is that this comes with a kingdom. This comes with a new age, a new era, and that the kingdom of God is to be established and with a king, and that we are to then to live in the way that Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ and his kingdom is the cure for humanity. And this whole Christus victor, which means the victory of Christ over Satan, is beautiful analogies that we will totally lose if we just go to the PSA and just look at it as just a sacrifice for the sins of the, of the uh, you know, for the sins of the Father. Um, so these both, I think, need to be there, uh, and they give us a beautiful picture of what the scriptures show us, and gives us both forgiveness and a life. Um, gives us a, a, a free st a standing with God and then a life of the church and a way to live and, and, uh, and giving glory to Jesus Christ. Without, it, without that side of it, it is very short-sighted. And, and you then lose all the teachings of Jesus. You lose all the kingdom concepts. You lose the Sermon on the Mount. You lose all this. And you can just say, well, let's just talk about what's important. And people say that that's just getting saved and just the penal substitutionary atonement part. The Christus Victor side is incredibly important because remember, our salvation is a person. It is Jesus Christ in all that he is, his incarnation, his teachings, his life, his death on the cross, his resurrection, his glory. Um, and all of that needs to be our salvation, not just pieces of that, but everything that Jesus represents. So that's why I think Christus Victor is also very important for us to have in, in our, in our um, atonement theology. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, thanks, Brother Dean, and thanks for all your, everyone else with your comments and questions and from the way it looks, we probably keep going here for quite a while, but maybe you have other things scheduled for the day as well. Um, yeah, I think maybe it's time to wrap this up. I appreciate your appreciate the thoughtful questions and, Amen, and your thoughtful um, yeah presentation there, Dean. Thank you for that. Um, calling us to to not be too reductionist in our views. Uh, I think that's I think that is important. I have a couple announcements and then I'm going to turn it back to Dean for just so you can just close us out with prayer, Dean. But, oh, so next week um, is an S2S sisters. So there's a, um, there's a, for the, for the ladies in your life, wife or sister, 
um, you can let them know. Um, there's by Deborah Rousseau next week, February 5th. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, and then two weeks from now, we have Charles and Sweezy coming on to talk about the creation to new creation curriculum that's being used. So I'm excited about hearing that too. So yeah, there's the announcements. Um, yeah, back to you, Dean. Any Anything more you want to say to wrap it up and just lead us in a closing prayer? Hey, man. Uh, so the only thing I'll just wrap us up is, again, um, looking at our salvation truly as the very person of Jesus Christ. And, and in that, I, he, you know, he, he gives his evangelism um, method into two words, follow me. And so Jesus Christ truly is our salvation. It truly is our theology. He truly is our way. I encourage, uh, it's not my intent for us to, to now tip the scales and lose Christus victors. I just said to the answering the other question, I think it's very important. I will appeal to all of us in the kingdom neo-anabaptist uh, world that there is a part of this atonement that, and that I, I believe that I'm encouraging us and I'm, if I may exhort us to look at these, these scriptures and allow us to ponder them in this light. I think that there's been some things that have come out in the, in the historical record that it gives us some credence to do that. And I think with that, I encourage every one of us to, to anew have an appreciation of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, of his salvation, of how he causes us to walk in his statutes and judgment. And that through that, I'm hoping that this will increase our holiness to him, that it will increase particularly our worship to him and giving him praise and glory and, and glorifying Jesus for all that he is. So, amen. <clears throat> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I don't want any theology or, or thoughts or scholars or things to muddy the purity of your word. You alone are to be praised. You alone are to be glorified. You alone. And dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and we say, please have mercy upon us. And please let your word and your word alone sanctify us and teach us and do your work. And dear God, I do pray that you would purify for yourself a people, that when the enemy has now come in like a flood upon us, that you will raise up a standard against it, and you will raise up a standard of people that will follow you and worship you and praise you and need you, oh God. So Lord, please give your Holy Spirit to this earth. Please bring your Holy Spirit upon your church that we will glorify you with everything we have. So Father, I thank you for this opportunity. I hope that you will receive glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, brothers. Amen. Thank you all for joining us. And God bless your day. And see you in two weeks from now. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend.